Hello and welcome to Travels Through Time, the podcast made in partnership with Jordan Lloyd and Colograph. Peter Moore. At the end of a very peculiar, and let's face it, quite testing year, Christmas is almost upon us. In this indulgent episode of Travels Through Time, we're off to discover the rich history of our favourite Christmas foods. Over the past five months, Violet, John, Artemis and I have had a hugely enjoyable time exploring specific moments in the past with some of the best historical tour guides imaginable. In this third season of Travels Through Time, we've roamed from the Neanderthals to the Beatles, over 25 episodes, and the best part of 100,000 of you have come along for the ride as well. Thank you very much for listening. If you have enjoyed our work, then please do let us know via our website or by leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or by simply telling a friend about us. Everything just helps us to keep making more episodes in the future. In compensation, as we round off season three, we're going to give away some signed hardback history books as Christmas presents. More about that at the end. Of course, we also have a fabulous Christmas special for you today as well. Today's guest is Penn Vogler, the author of the acclaimed new book, Scoff, a history of food and class in Britain. Recently picked as a book of the year by the Sunday Times, Scoff gives the reader a veritable banquet of delicacies through the ages. From the slippery history of jelly to the controversial question of cutlery, it's bursting with stories and unusual recipes for you to try out at home. For this special episode, we've decided to meddle with our format for once. Instead of limiting our guests to one year in the past, we've restricted them to just one day. So here is Penn Vogler taking Violet Moller on a tour back to the 25th of December in three different years. Welcome to Travels Through Time, Penn Vogler. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming on. I'm very much looking forward to our festive episode. And we're going to be talking about your book, Scoff, which uh, has just been published. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, what was last month? November. <laughs> That's right. Yes. yes. <laughs> um, well, congratulations. It, it, it's a feast of a book. I really enjoyed it. Oh, thank it's you. It's just full of so many great stories um, and so interesting. And I wonder how, how, how did you get the idea? Is, is this something you've been thinking about for a while? There was a very specific moment, actually, when the idea emerged and it came because a colleague and brilliant historian, Tom Penn, said to me, we were talking about the move from the Tudor palette to the Georgian palette. And he said, well, why did it change? You know, why did we lose that taste for all those spices? And and I thought about it for a while and I thought it's got to be the changing structure of our social class it's got to be something to do with the fact that more kind of women more housewives are kind of bigger and bigger middle class were being much more influential about what we ate and it became obvious quite quickly that if that was to do with social class then so many other things about why we eat about what we eat today are to do with social class. And so, you know, I, I thought about it for many, many years. So it probably took me about eight, nine years to think about and write. That's not surprising, though, because the amount of research that you've obviously done, and I mean, it is, it's really, really impressive. You, it, it covers the period of history from 1066 to today, which is a huge amount of time and and as you say different styles of food different tastes so many social changes and I wondered how how did you do the research what kind of sources were you using how 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 did you bring it all together I mean I'm very lucky because food history is becoming you know a discipline in itself and so had I done it sort of even 20 or 30 years ago, there'd have been a real paucity of sources. But people have been writing about food history now for the last kind of 10 or 20 years. But I think um, the most interesting sources are always the cookery books of the time, but also the literature of the time, you know, so what Jane Austen or what Thackeray 
is saying about food or how Hogarth is kind of portraying it or Bruegel or if you go back to the you know the uh, Bayer tapestry what, what's it what's being embro- literally what truths are literally being embroidered about the difference between Normans and Anglo-Saxon uh, kind of eating and drinking and dining styles so I think for me the importance in terms of sources was just to be quite wide and not just to not just of what was happening, but what people thought about what was happening, you know, what people were saying at the time, how they were trying to manipulate each other or change each other, or how they were trying to present themselves at the time, became incredibly important. Yes, and of course, food is intimately connected with so many other political changes. Or um, I mean, there's obviously a huge link between the spices and trade and the growth of the empire. I mean, there's just so, so many connections. It kind of imbues everything, doesn't it, food? Yes, I could have tried to do the book as a kind of worldwide thing, and I absolutely couldn't, you know, I had to kind of draw a line around more (laughs) more or less what we now call Great Britain. But, But yes, I mean, in terms of how our views of kind of immigrant food or our views of spices or our views of, um, you know, fresh food or, or, you know, how we're, how every so often somebody comes along and resets the clock and makes us think about things in a different way so obviously Elizabeth David does that you know in terms of looking at kind of Italian and and French and European food so yes influences are incredibly important but I just had to kind of put each of them through this lens of class and status and how people took all those influences and managed to kind of make them part of this kind of hierarchy that we seem to be quite obsessed about in Britain. And how do you think the historians, food historians of the future, will look back on our own age and our own attitudes to food? Because it seems, you know, over the last couple of decades, we have really begun to fetishise food and obsess over food in in, in quite new ways, I think. I mean, even if, if I think back to my own childhood in the early 80s, you know, food we ate was quite different in many ways, but also the way we thought about food, I think, was quite different. I think that's a, such an interesting question. And of course, as with any history, it depends where we end up, doesn't it? Yeah. Because if we manage to end up in 30 years' time with a kind of broadly egalitarian food system, we might look back at now and say things that happened such as the pandemic for example managed to make us understand the unequal food system we've got at the moment was just not something that we wanted to have in our society um you know all the stuff that kind of marcus rashford is doing around free school meals and that sort of thing and you know i i end my book by saying i just hope that some historian takes it off the shelf in the future and dusts it down and scoffs at it because thinking why on earth would you write that book about food and class it's irrelevant it doesn't matter anymore and yeah. it so much depends on what's happening in terms of our politics at the moment it turns it, it you know what the brexit deal or ends up with depends on yeah what kind of food we get in the future so and also our relationship and how we perceive ourselves as our relationship to the land to people who produce food to the you know to fisher men and women and to farmers all those things kind of have to go in the pot and whatever we end up with i think will determine what people think of now there are obviously some positive arcs and it might be that this is seen as the beginning of a a kind of acknowledgement that we perhaps didn't have in the 70s or 60s or 50s that food is an important part of our kind of cultural and social life but also an important part of our emotional lives and the idea that you have security and you have food security and it's at the center of your kind of family or kind of friendship group yeah I mean I'm hoping that that's what we end up with but who knows (laughs) yeah I mean it certainly it must be a we must be in, in a golden age in terms of what is on offer. I mean, I think that there was a statistic you put in the beginning of your book about there are 90,000 
items available in the whole Tesco's system. Was that was it correct? Was it Tesco's? I can't remember. But one of the big supermarkets. Yes, it was Tesco. Yeah. And I think it was a few years ago because I think they even thought, oh, my goodness, this is ridiculous. We might need to slim down a little bit. But yeah, yeah. and presumably that's not all food. No, but still, yeah, exactly. I mean, that, that's a huge, yeah. huge yeah. number. Yeah. Brilliant. So th- this this week, we're abandoning the usual tradition of asking you which year mm-hmm. you'd like to go back to. And instead, we are going to focus very very much on one day of the year, which is, of course, Christmas Day, the 25th of December. For your three scenes, I believe we're going to visit three different periods in history um, on Christmas Day and just talk about the kind of food that people would have been looking forward to eating. So uh, shall we start with your first scene? Will you tell us where where we're going and um, what's on the menu? So we're going to a kind of pivoting year and if we, in all honesty, we don't know exactly which year it is. It might be 1524, it might be 1526, but it is... That's fine. <laughs> but it is, we can so, be relaxed. Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of early Tudor. It is the year and it, it's a year where we can contrast what is happening uh, on Christmas Day or, to be honest, in that period around the Christmas season, because Christmas Day wasn't sort of so focused as it, as it is now. People celebrated Christmas over a much wider um, period. That's when William Strickland, who was a probably later Puritan trader and landowner from Yorkshire, is supposed to have brought the turkey into Britain. Ah, Uh and where did turkeys come from? They came from the New World. And the the name is very odd. Nobody really knows why they're called turkey, but it's, it's supposed that they were called turkey cocks perhaps because they were like guinea fowl or perhaps because people thought they came through Turkey. But anyway, that's the name we've ended up with. So the 1520s were an interest, a, a really interesting decade, really, to bring this meat back because so much was happening around then. Um, you obviously have the Reformation and you have this kind of abandonment of Catholic ideas of food, which are very significant. You have this emerging middle class, as we all know from uh, Hilary Mantel's brilliant novels, you know, where people like yeah. Thomas Cromwell um, were having more say in the way that things happened. And what another very interesting person besides Cromwell is somebody like Erasmus, for example, who wrote this book on the civility of children and he's saying I am a kind of as an intellectual as a middle class intellectual and telling you the aristocracy how to behave and more true nobility comes from my background than from all the kind of poncing around you know in um in suits yeah. of armor and things so that was very significant and then there's a sort of growing need for it came at just the right time because there was this growing need for meat you know the population was beginning to explode and there just wasn't enough meat to go around and later you know Edward VI and Elizabeth I started trying to kind of get people to eat more fish because you know there just wasn't quite enough livestock to go around and so the turkey comes in at a time when it gets adopted immediately by a much more of a sort of middle class, really, you know, than most meats were kind of seen as. So the kind of pre-Reformation idea of what was on your Christmas table depended entirely on who you were. And the ones obviously we know most about are the big landowners and the aristocracy and the lords and ladies. And we, yeah. and we know that what they have is just a huge amount of meat, particularly game and particularly venison. And that's the thing that everybody goes mad about at Christmas. But also peacock and swan. Also those things, peacock and swan. And since there aren't quite enough animals to go around, they even invented some, you know, the cooks would sew a capon onto the back of a pig and you'd invent this kind of cockatrice and all sorts of things and extraordinary every, yeah, idea extraordinary <laughs> and um and you know and bitterns and uh you know big beasts and porpoises were eaten us on um fast days because the idea was that they were fish and you know you could get around the, the yeah you know the rules. those restrictions and all the rest of it so so yeah so you you've gone from this kind of aristocratic very dom- dominated by this kind of aristocratic ideas of of um of meat 
together with these ideas, Catholic ideas of fasting. It's really interesting pre-Reformation because before this kind of understanding of husbandry that you get around the 17th century, you have to eat all your meat up around Christmas because you and your livestock are going to be competing for the same grain. On Martin Mass on the 11th of November, you start to slaughter your cattle, you slaughter your pigs. That's when your wild animals are at their sleekest. And that's why you have this great big blowout at Christmas, because there's probably not enough food to go around for all of you. You have to slaughter your animals and you'll salt some of them, but some of them you want to eat fresh. And then just try and get through February and March. Well, that's why you have Lent. Oh, of course. Because you, ha- yeah. because you have so few animals left, so, few, so little livestock left. You have to give them a chance to reproduce. And so the church and the agricultural year buttress each other in saying, OK, don't eat eggs, dairy, meat during Lent, because otherwise, you know, your livestock are not going to get a chance to reproduce. That's so interesting. So, so do you think it's possible that that was just a, a sort of pre-Christian necessity that then the Christian religion sort of took on as one of their traditions because it was a sort of pre-existing aspect of society or do you think that's a bit just a bit like easter you know i mean easter's eggs and rabbits haven't really got anything to do with the crucifixion Um, yes no i exactly i think so and they kind of supported each other okay you know it suited it suited the church and it suited you know it suited the church you know to keep people kind of pure yeah and keep people but it's also suited the agricultural year and the church kind of you know um waded in and and made sure that people behaved themselves And then, of course, you get to the Reformation and everything is just a bit harder and people start kind of pushing around, pushing those barriers. Mm. And so, like I say, the turkey comes at a really, really useful time. And how did it... So so this um, uh, man, I can't remember his his name... William Strickland. William Strickland arrives, presumably with more than one turkey. I mean, there must have been a few. And then did they did he sort of sell them on to farmers who then began to breed them? How did they be, sort of become established as a yes? I think as it livestock? became it, exactly it. But it becomes a farmyard meat almost immediately. So it's not seen in, as an aristocratic meat in the same way that um, game is or venison is, for example. And so quite quickly you get this um, this great farmer, landowner and poet called Thomas Tusser. Mm. And he writes these 500 points of good husbandry just in 1573, so about 50 years later. And he's telling you how to be a farmer, how to kind of keep everything going, you know, how to look after your animals, but also how to live well with the land in the year. And he already sees it at that stage as a Christmas meat. You know, you eat it with brawn, you eat it with what he calls shred pies, which are probably mince pies. Okay. And then a little bit later, you you have somebody called Gervais Markham, who he wrote all kinds of books and on all kinds of different subjects, including telling the housewife how to kind of be a good housewife. There's no evidence he particularly knew himself what the answer was. <laughs> but he, uh, he calls it a lesser landfowl. So, right. you know, it has this kind of status as being generally available to farmers, yeomen, and, you know, people with a, a good standard of living. Yeah. And of, obviously it's adopted for the aristocratic table as well. It, but it doesn't, it's not a key meat for them in the way that it is for the kind of middling sort. Yeah. I'm saying this with inverted commas. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. as I'm sure um, most people will be well aware, the another thing that was brought over from America around the same time, I think, was is another big feature of, the, of today's Christmas lunch, which is, of course, potatoes. Yes. But they, you, you say in your book, they didn't sort of, they took much, much longer to really be taken to the British hearts. Well, yes, and it's very difficult to know why. It's possible because they come from South America, um, they come from the Andes, they were seen as totally peasant, um, maybe, for some reason, you know, because of that. I think meat is always much more quickly adopted in Britain than vegetables yeah. and so if you look at potatoes tomatoes avocados it's taken them centuries to be adopted yeah well avocados is especially <laughs> yes. i mean it's, that's very very recent yeah, isn't it yeah. but it is it's astonishing though if you think about the potato and you think about chips mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. you know i mean the, the many many incarnations of potato which we all eat on a di- you know a daily yes. basis and you know you, you think of the potato as being an, a, a really a real symbol of the british uh, mm-hmm. kitchen 
And yet, you know, we've only had them for a few hundred years. Um, I mean, what do people eat before potatoes? Bread. Oh, so right. we were a bread uh, nation and it was seen and the bread, the kind of bread as an icon of your status and your class and your rights was very, very powerful. And so there are all these sort of sort of quiet wars going on about who got to eat what kind of bread. Mm. And, you know, the um, the kind of upper classes will say, you know, well, obviously we get the nice white bread, you know, which is flour that's sifted three times and all the rest of it. And But you, workers, because you're, you have big peasant digestions, but you will need uh, cheap, you know, fodder, you should be eating brown bread. And it wasn't very popular. And so, you know, as the kind of decades and centuries changed, people were more and more likely to just demand to have white bread. And it wasn't until around the late 18th century where you you start to get people who are much more sort of metric about recording what people ate. So you get this great guy called David Davis, who was a, I think he was a Welsh vicar and he said I really want to know what the poor actually eat because we always say this is what they should eat but I'm going to record it so he gets his other vicars to send in a kind of note of what their neighbours are eating and he says well you know these are the people they sow the yeah the the wheat wheat. yeah they do all the work they do the threshing they are the bakers so why shouldn't they eat white bread why should it just be for the kind of upper classes and so you know you get lots of kind of interventions in the bread debate yeah wonderful um well let's move on shall we to scene two which yes. is just over 100 years later can you tell us where we're going next well i think again it's a kind of pivot really uh between you know puritans and the kind of restoration so we'll go to about the 1660s and the puritan idea of Christmas, so, you know, there's nobody's nobody ever seems quite sure whether the Puritans actually banned Christmas or not, <laughs> or whether they just said, oh, you know, it's just not really a very good idea, and um, you know, it falls on a fast day, and you say, you've, you know, Christmas falls on a fast day this year, so you'd be better off not eating whatever you want to eat, and it's true, you know, the Puritans did attack this, you know, the aristocracy for their undoubted excesses at Christmas. And, and it wasn't just food, you know, it's dancing, parties, play acting, lots of drink and all the rest of it. But I think probably where the Puritans erred in sort of in propaganda terms was attacking the poor as well. And Christmas was perhaps the only time of year that most people, poor people would actually get anything fun to eat at all. And, you know, they didn't want to give it up. And why should they? There's a puritanical news sheet called The Flying Eagle from 1652. And it says, you know, the poor will pawn all the clothes of their back to provide Christmas pies for their bellies and the growth of abominable things in their vessels. And the poor just went, yep, we will, because, you know, it tastes good and we want to keep it. Yeah, and we want a treat. Um, We want a treat, thanks very much. You know, I mean, the Puritans obviously hadn't, uh, you know, been reading the Nobel Prize winners, Esther Duflo and Abhijit Banerjee, who say, or George Orwell, who say, you know, that's what poor people need. They need a treat to, you know, last them from one kind of miserable episode to the next. But what's interesting, I suppose, from the kind of food perspective is what they mean by Christmas pies and what they mean by abominable, uh, the growth of abominable things. And so, again, Christmas pies are probably the, the mince pies and they would have had, you know, things like spices and dried fruit, which would be seen as very, very excessive. And also at that time, still meat and the meat would change. You, know, so you might have had steak if you were kind of had the money, but it might just be tongue or heart or something or kind of chopped up. And as we know, you know, that's now been replaced by just suet. We tend not to have meat and on mince pies anymore. Yes, yeah, so that's very, I, 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 that was something that really came across was that, um, well, first of all, specifically with minced meat. And, and I had always wondered as a child why on earth they were called, well, why it was called mince meat. And, and yes. mince, I mean, it did seem strange, but it, it was very popular, wasn't it, to eat meat with a bit of sugar and spices sort of cooked together. That was a real feature of food it was a, it was a real feature and sugar was really so rare that it was really just treated as another spice you know a few teaspoons of sugar when did it first when did we first start eating sugar 
Well, I mean, we've had sugar since Roman times, so it's very difficult to really pinpoint it. And obviously, you know, as we've kind of grown, you know, imported sugar from yeah. the West Indies and everything, you know, our sugar consumption, it's got cheaper and cheaper on our sugar consumption has just grown and grown. But we've always, we've always... I mean, in Anglo-Saxon times, they probably didn't have sugar. They probably just had honey as a sweetener. Yeah. But I think the Romans had sugar, so it's difficult to pinpoint that moment. But um, the growth of abominable things is quite interesting because he's not saying at that stage Christmas pudding (laughs) or plum pudding because what you had to go with your Christmas meat was a kind of a potage, you know, would be some some grain or some breadcrumbs with again the spices the dried fruit a uh, bit of sugar and all the rest of it and that interestingly if that sounds a bit like christmas pudding it's because some genius learns how to turn that potage into a pudding by greasing a cloth putting some flour on it pouring the potage in it and it might be that stuff or it might be peas potage you know and then binding it all up and boiling it for a few hours and that's why you get those lovely old fashioned kind of round cannonball shaped christmas puds oh. or plum puds and that would have been eaten with the meat so it wasn't it wasn't a dessert at all so that would have been eaten with meat because in this in these days in the 17th century uh you tended to get sweet and savory food on the table at the same time everything was all kind of you might have two courses but everything tended to, you might have 20, well, it depends how wealthy you are, obviously. Mm. You might have 20 dishes, and of those 20 dishes, a lot of them would be roast meats and pies and things, but some of them would be sweet as well. But they'd all be out together. You wouldn't, you wouldn't kind of sit and have your first course and your... And your no, they'd all, be, they'd all be out together, all laid on the table together. Um, and that doesn't really change until the beginning of the 19th century. That's so interesting. And why, do you know why, did, why that changed? Like, what, was there any particular... It changed probably because the instigator was the Russian, the Russian ambassador in Paris, who I think in eighteen twelve served a served dinner in a different style. So instead of everything being on the table all at once, he served it one course after the other, after the other, after the other, um, in the way that we'd recognise now as a kind of how you'd be served in a restaurant, for example. Hmm. And it came to be known as the a la russe style of dining. And it came to be the kind of grand style of dining, how you'd be served at a banquet or something. And and it it was used as a kind of signifier of, you know, class and status. Whereas the old fashioned, everything on the table all at once style that we still have, in fact, at kind of family dinners for Christmas, you know, that that starts to be seen as a little bit kind of déclassé and a little bit old fashioned. And that's called that was sort of called the a la Francaise style of dining. OK, always French, and, yeah. always French. Yes, or, yes, yes. We yeah. were always looking over the channel with sort of slight inferiority complex, weren't we? I very oh, well, yeah, with sometimes with good reason and yes. Yeah. I like the, your chapter on gravy, which I think we, we, we should also mention. <laughs> I, I don't know whether they were eating gravy with their turkey at this point, but just talk a little bit about the gravy wars and the whole. <laughs> I thought that was great. Yeah, so gravy came to be, like I was just saying about pudding, you know, the the British or the English were seen as the inventors of pudding. And uh, the French went, yep, that's fair enough. We'll allow you, you know that invention you're welcome to it (laughs) and gravy was a sort of similar similar idea so whereas French chefs and French trained chefs in this country were all about this kind of concentration of flavor into a small amount of a delicate you know jus or you know sauce or something gravy came to be associated with a particularly British way of roasting meat where all the all the juice of the meat kind of falls out of the meat as it turns in on the spit in front of the fire and gets channeled into this great big lavish you know splash it all over kind of gravy and it becomes a bit ironic because sometimes cooks would slash the meat to make more gravy come out because everybody wants more gravy and then the meat gets dry so you need more gravy and the french are looking at us going oh for goodness sake you know what <laughs> what do they what are they like is there anything else that 
they would have been eating in the um, the 1660s around Christmas? Well, after the Restoration, obviously, there was a huge amount of interest in kind of newly fashionable things and newly kind of luxurious things and such as mead, the, the famous venison pasty, jellies, champagnes um, and wines and things. And also objects, you know, also tableware, things like um, all the kind of pur- puritanical ideas of very basic functional tableware, such as knives with very sharp points. That comes to an end and you have the new I, new shape of the knife with a kind of rounded point and um, people start buying silverware and glassware and and a lot of china for their tables. So the, ta- the table looks different and it has different, it begins to have different food on it. So after the, these years of under the Puritans and everything was sort of fairly depressing and, um, and you know, there wasn't a lot of overindulgence, was there a huge period of hedonism in the restoration um, with regards to food and, and, and did, you know, certain things come back in that hadn't been eaten, for example? Yes. And um, at Christmas time, you'd again, you know, you'd, you'd get to eat what there is available and it de- depends on how much disposable income you've got. But you start to get this idea of, of fresh fruit or, or a fruit anyway, being a kind of significant part of a diet because it looks so kind of elegant, you know, in a supper. Mm. And things like the thing that Peeps is really obsessed about, and I think he, I can't remember how many times he mentions it in his diaries, but he's he's obsessed with this idea of the venison pasty, which is a very kind of Christmassy dish. And again, venison, because it's not something you can buy in the shops. You need to have a deer park or you need to have friends with a deer park to have So it's it. very elite. It's incredibly elite. And his patron sends him Lord Hinchin book from uh, Northamptonshire, I think, sends him half a buck and he's so pleased with it and he gives it to his mum and gets her to make him a you know a venison pasty and they are extraordinary enormous kind of constructions with a you know with, it might be a shoulder or a leg of venison and not a pasty as we think now with it all kind of chopped so you up. wouldn't be able to have it in your hand and and, and um, eat it like a, 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 it. it's so <laughs> it's so not a cornish pasty <laughs> okay <laughs> yeah yeah and, uh, and can yeah. you just talk a bit about the history? Or, because it, it's, it's very, very, I mean, this is obviously going much, much further back um, in history again, but it's a very interesting, um, uh, so where the, the whole thing of hunting and venison, just just elaborate a bit on that, please. So it, it becomes part of the the hierarchy of the of the aristocracy, that access to game, particularly venison, you know, from the Norman conquest onwards and all that. Because they were obsessed with hunting. They were obsessed with hunting. Yeah, they seem to be obsessed with hunting. And, you know, they put aside all this, all this land for kind of hunting parks and game parks and deer parks, which was then became inaccessible to, you know, to, to peasants for their own, you know, foraging and grazing their own livestock and that sort of thing. So lots of, lots of... But they weren't clashes. allowed to kill the uh, deer, though, were they? That they was, definitely weren't some... allowed to. Yes, if you, <clears throat> if you killed it, I mean, even if you killed a rabbit, you know, you'd be in big trouble, which is a problem yeah. because rabbits don't know this. They don't know they're supposed to stick to the areas that, you know, <laughs> they're put yeah, aside for them. <laughs> Actually, on, on last week's podcast, I, I was talking to Charles Spencer about the Normans and yes. um, we did have quite a lot of conversation yes. about you know their punishments and how oh. they would happily blind you for having done something. Blind, very, yeah, putting eyes think. out putting eyes out and chopping hands off and things. Yes, absolutely draconian. But actually, I wanted to ask you a, a question related to that because he told me that, I think it was Henry I died after eating a surfeit of lampreys. And I wondered, what is a lamprey? Do you, can, you, can you shed any light on that? What is it? Is it a type of fish or sort of sea creature? A lamprey is a kind of, it's a bit like an eel. And um, oh. yes, it's a long, it's a long fish. And they are used these days for fishing bait, I think, as much as anything. But okay. a lamprey pie was quite a traditional thing. I think somebody even cooked a lamprey pie for Queen Elizabeth II's coronation as a sort of historical curiosity more yeah. than anything else. Um but they, like eels, they've sort of disappeared from off our tables. We don't think that they're, you know, the the kind of thing that you, you'd eat anymore. No. Well, thank you for clearing that up for me. <laughs> that, that's great. 
It's Artemis, one of the presenters on this podcast. You'll know that we've been working with the visual historian Jordan Lloyd and Colourgraph over the last few months to bring moments from our episodes to life, whether it's shots of the Beatles in 1964 or Oscar Wilde in 1882. Well, these wonderful colourised historical images and many more are available for purchase as museum-grade, archive-quality art prints at colourgraph.co. They make unusual, compelling and just really cool Christmas presents for that history fan in your life. And what's more, a selection of some of the very best prints are now available in a smaller size and for a smaller price. So for just £23 or $30, you can get a fascinating image of the Titanic or Mark Twain, Fidel Castro or Abraham Lincoln. Check out the full range at colorgraph.co. And remember, if you add the code TTT at the checkout, you get an extra 10% off. Um... All right, well, shall we go on to our third scene now, which is um, definitely one of the moments in history when we do really think of Christmas. It's it, it, it sort of when Christmas was kind of invented, really, the kind of Christmas that we have today, wasn't it? So can you tell yes. us where we're going? Yes. Well, it's um, it's an easy, it's a much easier to pinpoint this year because it is 1843. It's the year that Dickens published A Christmas Carol and it was, yeah, I think he published it right at the beginning of December and it just was this overnight sensation. It was a complete success. And what was interesting in food terms about The Christmas Carol is that all these ideas, as we said right at the beginning of this conversation, Christmas was a much longer period and you know we have turkey but people also had goose and they had venison and they had beef you know beef was the thing you had at Christmas if you were the kind of you know stalwart yeoman kind of middling sort of this country you'd be very very proud of your roast beef and what happens with a Christmas carol is that Dickens, because he has this extraordinary kind of imagination, takes some of these elements and he anchors them to one specific day, to Christmas Day, through the kind of Cratchit family. And if you look at what they're eating, it's quite interesting because in the Christmas present, the Cratchits are eating a goose because that's what you ate if you were poor. You had goose clubs, particularly in urban areas. And you would, like Christmas clubs, you know, you pay a bit of money into mm-hmm. them. Yeah. And and they're often held by landlords of pubs. And, you know, some people didn't like them. They were associated with a bit of kind of looseness or drink, drunkenness or whatever. Yeah. And at the end of your advent, you got your goose. And so that's a very typical thing for a kind of poor, not very, very poor, but, you know, but somebody like the Cratchit family, was, there's not much spare cash to go around. They might have a little goose. And then what, what Scrooge gives them is a turkey, which is much bigger, more kind of bountiful flesh. And it, it still has that element of being the, the sort of wealthy, urban, middle class, you know, people with resources. They get to eat their turkey. There's an expression in one of Jane Austen's characters. She talks about the the myrtle and turkey part of happiness, meaning the money, <laughs> you know, right. okay. the stuff that you get at Christmas if you've got the, the wherewithal. So the whole of Britain kind of moves to turkey focus. And from sort of from that moment, turkey begins to overtake roast beef in the minds of the great mass of the, the population as the thing to have at Christmas. Mrs Beaton has this great phrase, she says, For the middle classes of this empire, Christmas would not be Christmas without its turkey. And so that by (laughs) 1861, you know, it really has kind of... um, Been cemented. It has really cemented, yeah. 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 And the other thing that Dickens does really interestingly with food on this day is he takes this idea of the plum pudding, which if you read A Christmas Carol, there's no references to Christmas pudding anywhere. Up to that moment, it was a plum pudding. It was a it was a pudding of plums, and plums just means dried fruit and good things. Yeah, so it doesn't mean actual plums. It, it doesn't mean means... actual plums. It means good stuff, you know, yeah. like the plum job, the plum roll, yeah. or whatever. So he describes this, you know, this it has a bit of holly on the top, and he has some spirit, you know, poured over it. It's all a flame. So we kind of recognise it as a round cannonball. It's the thing that you know we eat or we aspire to eat, and then. Two years later, Eliza Acton, who's a very brilliant, brilliant uh, cookery book writer, has the first recipe or the first one that I can see for what she calls Christmas pudding. We know that she loved Dickens because she names one of her other 
uh, foods after him, Ruth Pinch's beefsteak pudding. And we know that she sent a copy of her cookery book to him. It was in his library. And she calls it the author's Christmas pudding. And I have a fancy with absolutely no kind of historical backup whatsoever (laughs) that she's thinking about Dickens when she talks about the author and that she's kind of attributing the plum pudding to him and calling it Christmas pudding for the first time. And is that is does it resemble our modern Christmas pudding in the It know, completely she's... does. Yeah. You can yeah. cook Eliza Acton's Christmas pudding. She says it's light and she's got a few recipes actually for plum puddings and Christmas puddings. But the particular one, the author's Christmas pudding, she says is light and rich. And it really is. It's really it's my it's become my go to Christmas pudding recipe actually, because it is completely perfect works really well it's really delicious yeah so it's moved from being this slightly strange concoction that sort of potage concoction yes. Yes. to being the the thing to that being the pudding yeah yes. yeah um and i also i'd like to ask you i don't know if this would have been on the table in 1843 but jelly featured oh, quite yes. heavily and not the kind of jelly that our kids buy in those funny squares and then pour boiling water over can you can you talk to us a bit about jelly and its fascinating wobbly oh, history? Oh, always. I just love <laughs> the history of jelly. So it had a long history of always something that was very elegant, very much part of a ball supper or a kind of restoration banquet, you know, or the banqueting course in the 17th century, which was actually the the third course of a of a dinner which might be had kind of separately for, you know, the inner sanctum of most kind of elevated guests. And jelly would be part of that course. And in the 19th century, it becomes a little bit more available to everybody. And people realise, you know, if you boil down your calves feet, you get this kind of gelatin stuff that will more or less hold this fruit juice or champagne or whatever you want to make it out of, more or less hold it together. And so there's this, in the early 19th century and the late 18th century, there's this kind of flowering of kind of jelly art, as they call it, on Bake Off, (laughs) rather fantastically. And I love that it's jelly art has come back to Bake Off. Yes, it's fantastic. I watched that episode. So wonderful. And it was also so tense because, I mean, how on earth you get jelly to you know, stay, to stay in yes. one place and stay yeah. still. Yeah. Yes, the jelly art of 200 years ago, you might make a Solomon's Temple. Yes, I read about you know. that. Yeah, and, and, it might and be flummery. a stars. What, what's flummery? You, flummery you is a creamy that. jelly. Really. Oh, OK, it's like a, a blancmange kind it's of like thing. It's like a blancmange, yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. But I love the idea of chefs sort of trying to outdo each other with yeah. increasingly yeah. mad designs for... Um, exactly, and they can never go very high, you know, six inches, because jellies will yeah. just collapse and so yeah. they started inventing kind of internal supports you know like <laughs> little spirals and things and different ways of cheating jelly physics yes but um it's a great thing I mean I love jelly as a kind of celebratory thing and in Yorkshire actually traditionally orange jelly was a kind of um a very Christmassy thing and I just think it's a great way of having a very light celebration. But we're not talking about those little squares that you make when you're no, a kid. No, no, no. Well, it can be very <laughs> elegant now. You get it sometimes sort of gin and tonic flavoured jelly with mm, bit, um, mm. currants suspended in it. It can be very, very beautiful. Oh, very beautiful. And, you know, you can, if you, if you, if you kind of um, get a concentrated fruit flavour, you know, from if you really stew the fruit and get the juice out, you can get this absolute hit of kind of yeah. you know, deep, deep kind of fruit flavour in your jelly. Um, or you can turn lots of kind of cocktails into jelly, which is yes. quite a fun thing to do. Vodka jelly, yes. that was definitely... Vodka jelly. Yeah. yeah, when I was a student, that, that featured yes. at various yes. parties. Um, and so I've, I, I, I'd like to ask what, one more question, which is um, really personal interest, because I really love bread sauce. And oh, I wondered yes, where, where and when bread sauce arrived, because um, my husband is Danish. And when I served him bread sauce for the first time, he just gave me that look as if yes. to I, I told, you know, <laughs> and British cuisine really is the worst on earth and I wondered if it came from from that sort of pottage stuff because from it's that sort pottage of, yes yeah exactly exactly okay. so it sort of separates out in a funny kind of way you know so you keep the breadcrumbs um and the in kind of the savory bit yeah uh, given that given that 
Yeah, yes, exactly, with the spices and the onion or whatever it is. So with the cloves or cinnamon or whatever, you you put it in it, nutmeg, isn't it? And, yeah. um, you know, you've taken out the fruit and some of the other spices and put those into the Christmas pudding. But so, but early recipes, there are quite a lot of medieval recipes for um, for slightly spiced meat, for example, with which are thickened with breadcrumbs. And if you taste them, if you make them and taste them, they taste a little bit like kind of a cross. <laughs> it sounds so disgusting, but I promise you it's not. <laughs> a cross between bread sauce and curry. <laughs> oh, no, I'm sure that would be delicious. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's nice. Another really surprising thing about that, that I discovered from your book was how long we have been eating curry for. I mean, I, I assumed it was sort of, quite a recent mm. thing sort of post empire kind of kind of thing but but that's not true is it curry has been on our not all of our d- dining tables but a lot of dining tables um since the mid 18th century so i think hannah glass who is the sort of most important cookery writer of of that period her 1747 cookbook um has a recipe for curry in and actually it's probably not that nice it's kind of chicken and lots of white pepper as far as I can remember maybe one or two other things yeah but yes I mean curry was served at the beginning in coffee houses at the beginning you could buy curry powder at the beginning of the 18th century um so we've had a long I mean we've had a long relationship you know with the Indian subcontinent and people a lot of the people well well, yes and and spices and and spices the medieval um kitchen was very uh, you know, of a certain level, it was very yes, much... Um, used yes, yes, although they you know. tended to be spices that had come f- with the Crusades back from the Holy Land. So there was a slightly different temperature of, you know, those kind of medieval spices. It was much more kind of Middle Eastern thing. Although obviously, you know, Middle yeah. Eastern, uh, you know, the spices didn't just come from there. They did, you know, they were traders. They came from all over the world. But um, yeah. it was a slightly different style of spicing to the to the ones that we then kind of imported as it were from from india oh i'm getting yeah now. um so <laughs> i think i'm i'm just going to ask you the final question which is um if you could have picked something up from one of these christmas tables mm. what would it be i am going to have peeps's venison pasty because a proper venison pasty done well would have looked spectacular Mm-hmm. It would have. There were designs in some of the kind of cookbooks of the time showing uh, how you'd make sort of a, a a forest with leaves and scrolls and of deer and things. You know, you make that kind of design out of pastry, and then it would be an enormous. Probably it'd be like a Fortnum and Mason hamper, basically with this huge <laughs> bit of venison in. And so it would look spectacular. And also, yeah. it's so not a thing we do today. We don't tend to get a whole hunk of meat and put it in a no. pasty. You know, we like to chop our meat up and call it a Cornish pasty and give it a give it an EU designated protection. Yeah, yes. absolutely. Yes. Um, I think that's an excellent choice. I think I mean I don't know how it would go down with your family if you put it on the table um, on Christmas Day, but um, I think it would look, as you say, spectacular. And it would kind of keep you going for a while. <laughs> It would definitely keep you going. Yeah. And um, perhaps not this year. You, you should wait for next Christmas. When I've got a bigger, bigger family. Of people, yeah. I think. Again, I think yeah. you're right. Um, it, this has been such a joy. Thank you for coming on for our Christmas special. It's been lovely. Thank you. Thank you, Violet. Thank you so much for having me. That was Penn Vogler taking Violet Moller on a splendid tour of Christmas through time. Penn's book is a delicious treat and a favourite of ours here. It's called Scoff, A History of Food and Class in Britain, and it is out right now. I mentioned at the beginning that we've rooted about in our Travels Through Time library, and we've found some fine history books to give away to you. So if you want to be in with a chance of winning a signed copy of Thomas Penn's The Brothers York, a copy of Owen Matthews' An Impeccable Spy, Stuart Clark's book, The Night Sky, and maybe a copy of my own book, Endeavour, then just head over to our website, which is tttpodcast.com. And when you get there, you just have to sign up to our fortnightly newsletter. The draw takes place this Friday, so the book should arrive just in time for Christmas. Thank you again to all of you for joining us for this third season of Travels Through Time. We're going to be back in January with a new series of recordings. But until then, a Merry Christmas to you all. And in the words of Tiny Tim, God blesses everyone.